in the This Is My Thesis, um, Design and Game Ethics, a Pervasive Game Adaptation of the Count of Monte Cristo. Uh, so for one week in January 2010, 15 players participated in a playtest of an adaptation of the Count of Monte Cristo. Uh, gameplay ran around the clock for seven days and took place throughout MIT campus. Um, Civility sought to transform the player's everyday campus environment into an imaginary 19th century Paris on the eve of Napoleon's Hundred Days. Civility involved role playing uh, where each player took on one of these roles. Characters were identified by their French monograms, and these are the 15 player roles, um, which included a banker, a judge, a dandy, a sailor, a duke, um, a ship owner, a soldier, and a servant for each aristocrat. Before the game started, players received an initial game pack. This included the rules, a character briefing sheet, um, a player map, and a game insignia to wear uh, on their person whenever they were playing. Um, players started out not being introduced to one another at the start of the game, uh, but slowly met each other as the week went on at in-game events in public spaces around campus. Each player was also given a dead drop uh, that was hidden somewhere. Um, a dead drop was basically a small Tupperware box that stuff could be put into. We hid several underneath benches. Um, my personal favorite was the dead drop belonging to Le Contrabandier. To get at this dead drop, you had to find the right locker and have the right combination. The primary game mechanic in Civilité um, involved players receiving documents and objects in their dead drops, including a copy of the Count of Monte Cristo. Um, all documents in included in, uh, information about a secret plot line, such as a scandalous love affair, or clandestine troop movements, or uh, secret political affiliations. Players had to decide what to do with the documents they received. Um, we could pass them on to another player's dead drop, um, or share them in person, or keep them for themselves. Players started out knowing about only a few dead drops. Um, they di could discover new ones by listening to audio prompts which were basically podcasts uh, that described the game world and gave hints to each location. Uh, and this is an audio promenade slip, uh, which has some instructions and a URL where players could download uh, the MP3. By collecting and listening to the audio promenades, players could find all of the dead drop locations. Um, this is the Game Master's cheat sheet with all of the dead drops marked on it. Players were asked to email a daily report to the game masters each evening that described their actions that they took each day and um, why they chose to do them. In the morning, players received news about um, the game world through the Gossip Rag website. Uh, this included narrative descriptions about what was going on and also displayed badges for, um, that players earned through their gameplay the day before. Players were confronted with a variety of ethical choices, um, such as whom to share the information with, since each piece of information could potentially damage another player's reputation. The badges recognized a range of ethical behaviors. Uh, here in the bottom right corner, you can see the thief and the saint badges. So I'm using Miguel C. Cart's uh, argument about ethics in games to organize my thesis into roughly two parts. The first part revolves around game designers and the ethics involved in designing games. Games are ethical systems that are embedded with their designers' ethical values, intentional or otherwise. In the game design process, we spend a lot of time crafting game mechanics that engage players in ethical and unethical behavior and encourage ethical reflection. I'm not going to be focusing so much on this part uh, in this presentation. What I am going to talk about is the second part, um, which has to do with players and uh, how they interact with games as designed ethical systems. Players are moral agents that activate the potential choices that game designers created, um, the potential choices that game designers have created in their games. This means that players think about ethics, they bring their own ethical systems into the games they play, and they respond and react to ethics in games. Uh, in the January playtest of Civility, players wrote about many ethical choices and issues in their daily reports. They talked about them at the group debriefing, and they talked to me about them in individual interviews that I did with them after the game was over. 
I've organized these issues into three ethical domains, uh, ranging from the ethics of stealing from the game masters to metagaming to uh, the ethics of making assumptions or asking clarifying questions. Uh, players took a variety of positions on each ethical issue along a wide spectrum of possibility. Uh, the first is the procedural domain, which has to do with ethical issues with regard to rules. Uh, the second has to, is the semantic domain, uh, which has to do with ethical issues in the context of the game world. And the third is the magic circles domain. Uh, to talk about the magic circles domain, I'm going to quickly talk about what is, what is the magic circle. So uh, game scholars Katie Salen and Eric Zimmerman define the magic circle as the idea of a special place in time and space created by a game. So basically, it's a metaphorical boundary between uh, that encloses and separates um, games from everyday life. And ethical issues in the, magical, in the magic circle's domain are ones that are related to that boundary or to the context in which games are played. Um, to better explain these ethical domains, I'm going to illustrate each domain with one or two examples from civility. Um, I, I want to also first point out that there, I'm going to be using photos from the playtest in each of the upcoming slides, um, and that the players shown in them are not the players I'm quoting for issues of privacy and anonymity. Um, also, due to time constraints, I'm not going to talk about the photos right now and tell you what's going on or how they're related to the ethical domain I'm talking about, but you can ask me about them in the Q&A. Um, for now, just let the photos remind you that each of the ethical issues that I'm going to be talking about actually took place um, during the game. The first is the procedural domain. Um, in Civilite, we intentionally designed a degree of ambiguity into the rules of the game with two goals in mind. The first goal was to invite players to consider the various possibilities that each ambiguous rule offered thereby creating ethical dilemmas. The second goal was to simulate a time period that was in heavy political turmoil, um, in which legal actions uh, taken on one day were overturned and illegal on the next. Some players clearly understood uh, and saw these aims. Le Soldat expressed in his interview, when you have a game that's designed in this kind of setting with these kinds of holes in the rules, my assumption is that you want some people to be doing some of these things and not doing some of these things. I did get the sense that the rules were meant to be morally gray because the world was gray. One of the rules that we, uh, that intentionally included ambiguity involved when players uh, could visit their own dead drops and when they could visit dead drops that belonged to other players. Um, in the rules we have written, each day before 2 p.m. you may visit your dead drop and retrieve any documents that have been provided anonymously to you. Each day after 2 p.m., you may visit dead drops that have been um, arranged for other citizens to pass along the information you have received. This had been carefully worded so that players would be free to interpret the ethical implications differently. Um, this offers players ethical choices and forces players to reflect on the ethics of each possible choice. Um, by intentionally using the optional word may, we hope to encourage players to question uh, this rule even further. Um, again, we are seeking to emulate turbulent revolutionary times um, in which the rules constantly shifted and ethical behavior was constantly challenged. On the very first day of gameplay, the procureur du roi mused in his daily report, it occurs to me that while 2 p.m. is a rather clear break between the picking up and dropping off of information, the boundary on the other end is less clear. Shall I begin to check my box only after dawn, or should I take the upper hand and check the night previous, examining boxes before their contents have uh, been withdrawn by their intended recipients, a moral quandary. It also occurs to me that perhaps I was intended to wait until 2 p.m. today to find the other drop boxes on my promenades, given that not everything had been withdrawn yet. If so, that is a silly one. <laughs> and certainly one I would not follow, given the necessity that I know the true goings on in the city. He clearly decided, as early as the first day, that regardless of the official rule, he's going to visit other players' dead drops uh, before two in order to keep himself properly informed. Although players <laughs> differed uh, on how they dealt with the before two, after two issue, um, this is clearly an ethical issue that has to do with the rules, um, as compared to the semantic domain. In this domain, 
ethical issues have to do with uh, the context of the game world. Um, in Civilité, the semantic context contains the ethical issues uh, that players were represented from their character's perspective in relation to the fictional 19th century Parisian world. One of the ethical issues that players contended with was the degree to which they were playing in character. Um, in other words, the degree to which they were making decisions from the perspective of the character role they were playing. Um, this issue takes into account the pre-prescribed character identities that we, the game designers, uh, had composed for each character role. This is the uh, character briefing sheet for La Domestique de la Doctoress. We attempted to compose the character briefings for each character as somewhat suggestive sketches of a character's past rather than a portrait of their motivations or desires. La Domestique de la Doctoress wrote quite elegantly about her thoughts and feelings in her daily reports. On the second day of gameplay, she wrote, I'm a loyal servant. I figure my character will probably do anything she can to help her mistress out of any sticky situation she may be in. This early reflection uh, on her character's relationship to La Doctoress uh, guided her subsequent actions in the game. On the fourth and fifth uh, day of the gameplay, she describes how she dealt with a particular ethical issue that arose. She wrote, I'm ashamed to admit it, but I took the letter from Le Gendarmerie's box. I left the note telling of the writer's suspicions of La Toulouse, but without evidence, I do not know what can be done. I took the letter in a moment of panic because it makes reference to the lady. Knowing my mistress to be friends with the Duke, I worry that she might be caught up in this, and I wish to avoid damage to her reputation. On the next day, she wrote, this afternoon I attended the party at the cathedral, where among other things, I learned that the lady referred to in the note I found in the gendarmerie's box is more likely to be uh, Le Socialite than my mistress. So in the interest of justice, I replaced the note <laughs> in these daily reports, she expresses that she feels shame uh, for stealing a document from Le Gendarmerie. Um, her actions are guided not by whether stealing from an NPC is allowed in the rules or not, but by what she feels her character would do in this situation. Another ethical issue that uh, players dealt with had to do with the specific actions uh, they could do when interacting with one another. We designed game mechanics that would prompt players to consider lying, spying, stealing, and sabotaging one another, and in the process hopefully consider the ethical uh, implications of these actions within the semantic context of civilité and also in the larger everyday life context in which civilité was being played. Uh, some players had no ethical qualms uh, with taking these kinds of actions, but others, like La Doctoress, uh, felt differently. She wrote, Upon these travels, I discovered a package for the Procureur de Rome. I was tempted to open it, but I cannot bring myself to open another's mail, no matter how juicy the secrets within might be. So these um, are ethical issues that players dealt with, again, within the context of the game, um, as compared to the Magic Circles domain. Players' concern about ethical issues in the Magic Circles domain um, are concerned about the ethical con consequences um, of actions in the context of everyday life. As Lamateur aptly put it, unless the gameplay extended into the real world and real psychological places, I didn't see anything as being truly moral or immoral. In Sabute, players consistently articulated that they were afraid of ruining other players' gameplay um, or ruining other players' fun. They also voiced that they were afraid of breaking the game or ruining my research. <laughs> Two players who allied with one another uh, during the game and who were also friends before gameplay began uh, used this dimension to explicitly determine what they considered ethical and unethical. Uh, Le Procureur de Ra said that he judged whether he would do something by whether it would interfere with other players' play. Um, on the third day of the game, Le Socialite wrote, I didn't feel bad about stealing the directions from Larry Tur until Le Procureur de Ra told me that he would feel bad about it. I realized that I might be interfering with Larry Tur's gameplay and that could make the game less fun for him. As a result of this conversation, uh, she asked Le Procureur de Ra to return the thing she had stolen to, the, to Larry Tur on her behalf. My original research question 
was, how does one design a game to make change? And now, this is an incredibly broad question. So it was refined to, how can I define, uh, how can I design a game that engages players in ethical gameplay? Um, the three ethical domains that I identified from the playtest provide game designers uh, with some ways to think about ethics as they design games. Um, designing playtesting and reflecting on civility has brought up a lot of further questions uh, that would be really exciting to explore. Some of these include, how do ethics change for games that use different game media? So how do ethics change on PC uh, games, console games, card games, board games, MMORPGs? Um, how do game ethics change for games in different genres? So civility was a historical fiction, what about science fiction, fantasy, stealth, and so on. Um, and what sorts of ethical game issues come up uh, in other pervasive games? versus Civilité, which is um, a one very specific design game. Um, I'd like to conclude by thanking the other game designers who worked on Civilité. Uh, these are the full credits which appear on the Civilité website. Um, to all of these wonderful people and to all of the wonderful players who participated in the playtest, thank you. So um, the process of designing this originally started with me thinking about uh, doing an adaptation to a digital game uh, for a solo experience. And choosing to do a pervasive game was part of my design process where uh, it was influenced by another pervasive game that I had designed that then drove me in this direction. I think that pervasive games were a, a really interesting tool to use to explore ethics because they blur the boundary between everyday life and the game world. And they change the way that players think about ethics. And that was one of the questions I was really trying to um, investigate, is how, do, do players feel differently? Are, are there different pressures that um, they experience when the game is taking place in their everyday environment, when there are uh, audience members walking through, um, and things like that? Um, so you talk about the magic when you're doing a pervasive game or something that is integrated with every day life, uh, I think you get into the bit uh, of ways in which we're poking it. So can you elaborate a bit more on how the magic circle, circle really falls apart in this? I, I, I think that it falls apart, but it's, it's not so established, it's not so divisive as we might think. Definitely. Um, so let me see if I can get to, OK. Um, <laughs> My bonus slides include what is a pervasive game. And Marcus Montola defines a pervasive game as a game that has one or more salient features that expands the contractual magic circle of play spatially, temporally, or socially. And so certainly civility doesn't have a very fixed magic circle. Um, and I have some slides to show how it breaks each of those dimensions. The first is spatially. It took place around MIT campus in uh, research areas, uh, in hallways that are not designed game play spaces. Um, this is uh, a gathering in which there's some players on the ground floor talking and discussing documents that they've received, and then there's this player up here who's spying on them and they don't know that he's there. Um, <laughs> it also uh, changed, it also expanded on the, the temporal dimension in that the game ran around the clock. There was, it was hard for players to it, it wasn't like, okay, now the game is on, now the game's off. I'm going to sit down and play, and now I'm going to get up and do my, the rest of my life. Of course, some of the players did very clearly delineate, I'm setting aside this time in my day to play the game. Um, other players would be walking around campus and just be like, oh, I want to go do this thing now, um, even though it's in the middle of my day, I didn't plan it, and so on. Um, this is uh, one of the in-game events that took place in uh, Lobby 7. Um, that was in the middle of the day. And then uh, the last one is the, the social dimension, where it has to, uh, Montola describes this as the, um, 
talking about who are the participants in the game. Um, and in most games, you have the players, and then you have people who are not playing the game. They're not players. Um, some, some games, you have spectators and so on, but um, usually it's the game is made up of, of players. Um, in our game, we, we purposely put it in public spaces to try and engage with the, this, um, the, with the public and, and place um, everyday people walking through campus as citizens of Paris. Um, and some players did articulate, I, I did feel like the people walking through made the space seem more like a bustling city. Um, this is one of uh, Game Masters masquerading as a player. Um, and in that same event, this is the Game Master. And this is a tourist taking a picture of, of the game. So the, the, the social dimension can range from um, directly engaging uh, non-players um, into gameplay for moments or temporarily to spectatorship, as in this case. Um, I have a question about uh, the ambiguity of the rule. So if someone who played the game, I know that a very prominent feature um, among the people who are, who are playing was the fact that the rules, like you had mentioned, were sort of intentionally ambiguous, and that for some people who were very experienced with pervasive games and this kind of thing, that was a very frustrating experience for them. Um, this one wasn't as well versed in those kind of games. It didn't bother me as much, but it seems like pervasive games don't necessarily have to go hand in hand with ambiguous rules, and that they would invoke ethical decisions and have ethical dilemmas, regardless of whether or not the rules were ambiguous. So I'm curious, just to hear your thoughts about that, about what you think would have happened if you had had a game that had more concrete rules, or you know, what role you think ambiguity has in all of this. Certainly. Um, so definitely, ambiguous rules is not necessarily tied to pervasive games. Um, the, I have identified those in my thesis as two separate tools that um, were deployed in Civilite um, as a, a series of strat uh, some a subset of the series of strategies and tactics that we use uh, when designing the game to engage players in ethical and unethical behavior and ethical reflection. Um, amb ambiguous rules was a difficult one um, and one that I'm not sure, having done the playtest, I would necessarily recommend because it was actually one of the game mechanics that was very frustrating for players. Um, and I think that one, one way that that could have been mitigated was if when we were asked about the rules that were ambiguous, that's when the amb ambiguity stops. Because now you've asked the authority, you get an authoritative response. And instead, we're sort of like, more ambiguity. And that, that just translated to frustration. Um, so I think that a game that doesn't have um, the ambiguous rules can still use a variety of other strategies to get at some of the same things. So maybe what's coming out of this is that the, the sphere, the ethical sphere, which is like most disruptive for players to have to think about as they're in the game, is the magic circle sphere. So when you have to worry about whether your, your action, even though it's permissible, could be disruptive of other people's play experiences, then that's like an extra burden, which normally in, in more uh, structured kinds of games you wouldn't have to worry about. Maybe maybe that's one of the design issues. Can you take a little bit of yeah, um, key insights which we can take a look? I would say that uh, for some players, they were thinking about um, and talked about the, their, the ethical issues that I would say had to do with the magic circle. Um, and that was very much a frustration. But for some of the players, it was not a frustration. That it was just part of their awareness um, of the game and the way they thought about the game. I would say that the magic circle is that that ethical domain becomes more um, uh, in the center of a player's focus in pervasive games, in games that um, put you in put, move the the line between your everyday life and the game under question, um, less so than necessarily um, that necessarily that the, 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 the magic sort of putting the emphasis on that may have to do more with it being a, a pervasive game than, than 
to know if, uh, in the face of ambiguity, there arose any like house rules. I know that we live in an age of uh, increasingly crappy board game documentation, <laughs> um, and uh, and so there's sometimes like you just come up with your house rules, and I wonder if that arose. Oh, certainly. So um, there was a, there was definitely um, a, a lot of emergent play, um, and because this was a collaborative storytelling enterprise, which I didn't really get into in my uh, presentation, um, when when gameplay emerges from the players, the game masters have to respond uh, real time. Um, and so we certainly came up with things that were okay, weren't okay, on the fly. Players always uh, came up with ideas that we never uh, would have accepted. Um, also, before we get too much further into the Q&A, I brought tangible artifacts that I'd like to pass around if you want to see them. Um, so this is uh, one of the boxes. And then this is a sample map. And this is an insignia. Um, and this is a one of the player game packets that was handed out in the beginning. I'm curious a little more uh, about uh, hearing a little more about how the game actually instantiated the the, the, the story of uh, you know how the story played into this whole project. Just you know, I know it's a big subject, but just a few words. Sure. Um, so uh, my original concept was to do a very tight adaptation, um, and throughout the the, uh, the research process, it became much more. Uh, I became much more interested in doing a looser adaptation based on the themes um, and the setting um, and the space of, of the Count of Monte Cristo. At the same time, um, even though we as game designers came to um, adopt that, the, the plot lines that we chose actually very closely mirrored several of the plot lines in the Count of Monte Cristo. The characters you may have recognized are abstractions of Dante's and Mercedes and uh, Villefort and so on. Um, but it was much more trying to evoke the, the atmosphere and uh, try and uh, talk about the themes of ethics and justice and injustice um, and law and revenge that come up in the Count of Monte Yeah, um, it seemed that the whole thing worked. So it seemed that the players kind of like got into it and did not like when rules were broken too often when they got disorganized. And he said your first question was that you were interested in people change. And um, what's on my mind in the last time a lot is, what do you think? Like, I think, um, what got clear that they changed in the game? But do you think they changed? Like, did they really reflect on their ethical system too? Do, what experience did, did you make in the interview? Do you think it worked? Or uh, what, what do you think about that? So I would say that um, my original uh, research question, how, how does one uh, design a game to make change, I think is, is very broad and intentionally worded um, in the sense that I'm, it, I'm understanding make change uh, very specifically, that it can be anything from taking action to reflection to uh, awareness. And so to bring that um, to something I I could actually research, I tried to focus it to how can I design a game um, that engages players in ethical um, gameplay. And I think that that's what Civilite did. It was uh, an exercise, um, uh, research through design exercise on how, how I could, uh, what are some strategies to think about that kind of game design work and also um, what are some of the ways that players respond to those kinds of strategies. How, how do the players think about ethics? Um, there are certainly strategies that we use to encourage ethical reflection, um, which is, gets a little bit closer to um, changing. But it wasn't, civility was not uh, set out to say, your ethics are this, and now you are now something more ethical. Um, <laughs> but that uh, more about like trying to incorporate ethical reflection as part of the gameplay. So the daily report mechanic was really um, surprisingly effective. That players 
often wrote about um, very nuanced and specific um, ethical issues. And I mean, of course, all of the players, because this was research, they all knew what I was, they all, you know, got my cooties forms and they knew what I was going after. Um, but, you know, as you're playing a game for seven days, it was still very surprising to see them continue to think about these things and say these things um, as the game went on. Yeah, I kind of want to ask more about that sort of like prior knowledge of your goal and how you feel like. I mean, I would see that as part of the game. Um, how do you, like, how would you, would you incorporate a similar sort of prior knowledge in a future game in a, in a different way? Like, not through the storms, but through some other kind of mechanic? So, um, for this game, I had to be very clear because it was research. To clearly state what my research goals were and how I was going to go about them, and um, what I was, what kinds of uh, research I was, uh, what kind of results I was asking for. So I was saying things like, "You will be writing, you will be writing reports and emails to me, talking about what you did and why you did them." <laughs> um, I think that in a, in a future game, whether I would or wouldn't do that, I think it would have to. Be, depend on the context, um, as in what what is the goal that you're trying to accomplish with the game? Is it um, around education, or is it around awareness, or is it is it something um, that you want to communicate a message in a way that players come to realize it, and discuss, uh, like a process of discovery? Um, so I, I think it certainly depends. I was wondering um, if you had any further thoughts on how your players negotiated sort of their two personas themselves and the characters that they took on, and what was ethical for themselves and what was ethical for their characters, especially when the line between what's out of game and what is what's in game begins to blur. I know in live action role playing, there's a what's often referred to as meta gaming when you acquire in game knowledge in an out of game setting and then use that to your advantage in an in game setting. And I'm wondering if similar ethical ponderings came up like that and how how, how you and your players address them. Yeah, definitely. So, Civility was designed for a really broad audience. Um, I was, we knew going into it that we weren't targeting um, live action role play uh, players or players who had role play experience specifically, but we wanted to include them. Um, we wanted to include MIT staff, uh, undergraduates, graduate students, um, affiliates, and because there was going to be such a broad range of players, I knew there's, we were going to get a lot of variety on those issues of playing in character or playing as my own self um, in the game. Um, and the, the players who uh, were playing in character very much thought of it that way. They would say, well, I was playing, I was always playing in character, I always spoke to people in character, I went into game when I put on my insignia, and I came out of game when I took it off. Um, and other players didn't think about it that way at all. Um, so I think for some players there was that concern, and others there wasn't. Similarly with metagaming. So the players that I um, talked to described that as um, using out-of-game knowledge, right? Um, that you are knowledge that you gain um, when you're not in character, and use it um, in character. Now. Um, there are a few other things that I identified that are similar to them, but not exactly the same, including fidelity to one's character, which um, I talked about with the la, uh, la domestique de la doctoress, that she was very much um, trying to be uh, have high fidelity to her character as she understood it. Um, and there's also fidelity to the game world, that some players very much believe I shouldn't use modern technology because it wasn't available in 1815. And other players extrapolated that as, well, I can take notes, and the modern, like, the contemporary um, equivalent is snapping a picture on my, my cell phone. Um, and so different players negotiated that differently. Um, that did lead to some tension uh, from 
the game master is not having a hard and fast rule. Yes, you can use um, email. No, you cannot use your cell phone. Like this, that this is yes, that is no. Um, and partly that was, you know, the feel was the uh, the spectrum of possibilities was so large. Um, but to get back to your original question, yeah, there. I get into that a little bit more in my thesis, specifically breaking down different identities that I think players uh, have when they play games, from uh, their everyday life identity, which is you know us talking now in, in everyday life, and then the, uh, the character identity, which is the character as it was created by the game designers before you start. Then uh, this is partly using Jim Gee's uh, framework, the productive identity where it is me as a player having my aspirations for this character. And that, I think, is what um, you would say is your in-character um, identity. And then I would also say there's a, a procedural identity, which is you as a player, that you as a player is different from you in your everyday life, and that you as a player manifests whenever you're playing games, and that it translates from game to game. Um, does that sort of answer that? I just had a sort of thought. Um, I know we've talked a little bit about uh, Mia's work on, on about cheating and about sort of adjusting games to sort of fit your uh, your in own enjoyment, your own skill level, et cetera. And I'm curious if you thought about the way that people negotiated with these rules where cheating is a sort of ambiguous thing, so you wouldn't necessarily call it cheating. But I guess reflecting on my own experience, it seemed like part of what people were doing uh, was changing the game to fit either what they were had the time to do or what they had what they would enjoy. Like there was the question of you know. You could only contact people one time a day. So if you wanted to contact them more times, you either had to get in person or on email. And so like I started emailing people because that was a way of adjusting the game to sort of fit what I could do. I don't know that's sort of a comment. But yeah, um, there's definitely a really good example that related to that before two, after two, um, was one of the players couldn't start playing until the second day. Um, and so that was her first day in, in the game. And from the beginning, she broke that before two rule because she didn't get into town until after two and she wrote in her report i broke this rule already i feel kind of bad but if i didn't do that then i wouldn't be able to play and so it was it was in a sense adjusting adjusting the rules in order to allow her to continue to engage with the game yeah this is uh i think an, an, an excellent example of the kind of uh, contribution i think that, um, in the last maybe 10 years or so have been made to what I think hasn't received the name of like moral philosophy of games, but could really stand for systematic right work. So I'm just wondering the degree to which you saw this as sort of fitting within, you know, concepts of the, um, the original state or the social contract, Lockean concepts, you know, the idea of Hobbes and the sort of established state or the Soviet Nietzschean possibilities or the public sphere and all these different you know, all of these different ethical questions that have been treated in all these different ways, but which for some reason, you know, like philosophers in the sort of the ethical side have still not come to game to look at them, which is, I think, a shame. So I'm just wondering the degree to which you saw that as interesting or that you might see this as something that some, somehow either it's not undergirds, uh, informs or colors, or maybe even, you know, somehow <coughs> connects with some of these ideas, because it seems like what you have is fundamentally empirical answers to some of these questions. Um, so certainly, um, it was definitely something I'm, I've been engaging with, um, but because of the scope of my project, um, I chose intentionally not to engage too deeply with moral philosophy. Um, the scholar that I quoted earlier, Miguel Sicart, um, does to a, a, a very strong degree, as do several other scholars. Um, so um, I, I chose intentionally to let civility be about what the players um, in this particular test spoke about without trying and the way that in the, in their words um, i didn't necessarily want to um, be categorizing them and, and how they responded to the game so taking up that point if I understand correctly, so you decided actively not to use some sort of independent metric to find out who was gaming the system, how they were gaming it. You know, in other words, it's a trade-off between enjoyment and some sort of 
equal way to play to play the game. For instance, if everyone had worn a little transponder and in the vicinity of you know, each one of the drop boxes, you knew who, what time they came, etc., how long they stayed there, and then you cross index that against their self reporting you would have something that would be more of a reference. But if I'm understanding what you're saying, you chose actively not to do that, to yeah. allow it to be more of just a <coughs> fun on a per person basis as opposed to trying to understand where the system technically worked or broke down? Yeah, we chose um, intentionally not to do that. We did have, we did, um, in early drafts of the game design, we did design in a lot of these checks, checking mechanisms to see are the players lying to us in their daily reports? Um, are they actually doing what they say they're doing? Um, but we, as the game grew in complexity, we decided that um, that wasn't what we wanted to focus on. Um, and so we, we let that piece go. Uh, the time span of your game, seven days around the clock, is sort of an abnormal time span for a game. I think if you were to take a poll of people and just have them name some games, they would typically name either things that are finishable in an evening or are things that are somewhat permanent, MMOs, things like that. And we're in an era now where the permanent games are starting to have, you know, players are having legal rights to virtual property. And that's very much tied to ethics. And so I'm wondering how do you feel that your ethical domains change along the time spectrum from very short games to games of your length to longer games? That's a really interesting question. Um, I think one that would definitely fall into the further questions one, it's not one that I haven't engaged a lot, that I, that I have engaged a lot with um, so far. Um, a lot of players did respond uh, and talk about the seven day period. Most of them expressed that they felt it was too short. Uh, for the type of gameplay that we were asking for. In particular, the dead drop mechanism was intended to be slow, to simulate um, the slow uh, transfer of communication between people in, in uh, the early 1800s, but that, coupled with the seven-day restriction, actually felt really slow, and I think that certainly affected the ethics of um, when they felt like they could check their boxes. There was certainly a sense of, well, if I had more time, then maybe I wouldn't go around stealing things from other people because it would just come to me later. Um, or if I had more time, then I wouldn't be checking my box, uh, you know, at all hours because I feel this pressure of the game. That's um, okay. um, yeah, that's it. <laughs>